Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Marianne. Today, we are presenting measurement and disclosure of quality indicators, which express the healthcare quality and improvement activities, presented by Dr. Chuguya Fukui. Dr. Fukui is the Chairman of the Board of Trustees and the President of St. Luke's International Hospital, one of the most prestigious hospitals in Japan. In 2015, St. Luke's International Hospital had won the IHF Dr. Kwang Tae Kim Grand Award. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. The presentation will be followed by question and answer. Today's webinar will be available on demand after the live session. You can watch the recording at the IHF website. Now, without further ado, we will turn the time over to Dr. Fukui. Dr. Fukui, please start your presentation. Okay, thank you, Marianne. I appreciate the introduction. I am pleased to have this opportunity to address you all over the world on the topic of my utmost concern for years, that is, a variety of activities to improve quality of care, including patient safety in hospital. First of all, we, all the staff at St. Luke's International Hospital in Tokyo, are grateful to International Hospital Federation for granting us a very prestigious Dr. Guan Tae Kim Grand Award, the highest award in October last year. I understand this award has recognized our contribution in spreading throughout Japan our activities to improve quality of care using quality indicators in the framework of PDCA cycle, a kind of improvement model. Kaizen model in Japanese. This is the list of topics I'm going to cover from now in 25 minutes. Let me start by explaining a little bit of the history and the current standing of our hospital, St. Luke's International Hospital. Our hospital was founded in the central Tokyo by a physician missionary from the United States in 1902. St. Luke's has long been regarded as one of the most prestigious hospitals in our country because of its initiatives in renovating medical care in many aspects. For example, the first American-style internship training of physicians started here in Japan leading to its current status as one of the best postgraduate training sites for both physicians and nurses. Other examples include medical social work, a comprehensive health checkup program, and medical information management. Ten years ago, as president, I reviewed and laid down the goals of hospital administration. Among these eight items is the practice of evidence-based medicine, which I had been promoting in Japan since I came back from the United States in mid-1980s. Uh, we, as professionals in medicine, work at all times with the intent that every patient will get maximum benefit from the care we provide. In line with this, clinical guidelines and care pathways have been formulated based on as much as possible high quality evidence. And we do know that once these tools are used on the ground, quality of care is likely to get better. However, there is abundant evidence that not all practitioners follow the evidence even years after the evidence was established and described in standard textbooks. I have a vivid memory of a research article published in early 1980s which showed that only a small proportion of acute myocardial infarction patients received a beta blocker 
after several large-scale clinical trials had already demonstrated effectiveness of beta blocker in preventing the recurrence of myocardial infarction by about one-third. In terms of the gap between established evidence and actual practice, there are many reasons why we don't practice evidence-based medicine. For example, we may not know the evidence itself. We may not believe the evidence even if we know it. We may not have a new drug or device at our disposal. And our patients may prefer old treatment to new one. Whatever the reason to narrow the gap, we have to recognize the presence and the degree of the evidence practice gap. Here comes quality indicator. Once we recognize the gap between the real situation and the attainable ideal outcome, we can create feedback cycle, known as PDCA cycle, to continuously improve practice by a variety of means. I made a decision as president of St. Luke's in 2005 to measure quality indicators as a means of improving quality of care we provide. To this end, I set up the QI committee, which means both quality indicators and quality improvement. The committee consisted of 32 staffs from various specialties and areas of expertise. The policy of selecting quality indicators was as follows. Priority was put on process and outcome indicators rather than structure indicators. We looked up on web the reports from the United States, Australia, and European countries. We sought the opinions and ideas from significant number of staffs of a variety of specialties and clinical departments. I also chose, whenever possible, uh, quality indicators which could be extracted from our electronic patient record system. I discarded quality indicators which would place additional burdens on clinical staffs to compile the data for quality indicators. As you might imagine, this was extremely important to avoid unnecessary opposition from physicians and nurses. The activities of QI committee have been published in book every year, as well as on website, to let the public and health professionals recognize the importance of quality issues in medicine. English version is also published every, every other year. Let me show you several examples of quality indicators to illustrate how we improved quality of care. This slide shows the percentage of patients with type 2 diabetes whose hemoglobin A1C was controlled below 7% at the end of each year. The denominator is the number of all diabetic patients prescribed glucose-lowering drugs at least for three months from doctors at St. Luke's in that particular year. The numerator is the diabetic patients whose hemoglobin A1C was controlled below 7% at the last checkup in the year. The figures were 31% in 2004 and 32% in 2005. Data were analyzed for individual physicians. The percentage of successfully controlled patients showed wide variation from 81% by Dr. A to 39% by Dr. F. There was also a wide variation in the percentage of different glucose-lowering agents prescribed by individual physicians. Since diabetes is so prevalent and pervasive in the developed countries, including Japan, the number of specialists in endocrinology is simply not enough to take care of all diabetic patients. And therefore, 
non-specialist physicians have to continuously catch up latest advances in the care of diabetic patients. As shown in this slide, there was wide variation in the use of glucose-lowering agents, showing some are behind the latest advances in pharmacological treatment of diabetes. Hospital-wide seminars and lectures on how to use appropriately new glucose-lowering agents were held frequently in 2006 and 2007. I myself asked physicians with, with low performance to attend these seminar and lectures. Other interventions include, included asking physicians in charge of patients whose hemoglobin A1C kept higher than 8% for more than six months to seek consultations from endocrinologists. Hospital-wide percentage of different hypoglycemic drugs prescribed changed between before and after these seminars, lectures, and other interventions. There emerged an encouraging case with clearly improved performance. Dr. C's performance, for example, jumped from 59% in 2005 to 90% in 2007. This bar graph shows the performance for each physician. Once or twice a year, I ask them separately to come to my office to receive this bar graph with a circle I put on his or her bar. The result of our efforts is shown in this slide. There has been continuous improvement in the percentage of target attained diabetic patients. As an example of our approach to patient safety, the next three slides show the improvement in the complication rate from central vein catheterization. Initially, we hit the rough idea that the complication rate at our hospital, about 8% in 2007, might be too high compared with 4% reported from other hospitals in the literature. We developed a template to gather data in more detail, including the characteristics of operators and learner physicians insertion method employed, and clinical outcomes. The complication rate was 6.2% in 2008. It turned out that echo-guided subclavian catheterization caused complications most frequently. So we invited an outside instructor to teach this skill to both our residents and attending physicians several times a year. We then launched a credentialing system in which only physicians who met the requirement were allowed to do the procedure independently. The requirements consisted of three categories, that is, a demonstration of successful insertion on simulator experience as an assistant on three patients, and then three successful catheter insertions in real patients under the guidance of the teaching staff. The result was also dramatic. The overall complication rate has declined to the level far below the target, resulting in as low as 0.5%. This pie graph shows that among the quality indicators we measured in 2004 through 2012, 65% have dramatically improved. Of importance here was that far majority of these improved indicators during this period of time were not treated as enthusiastically as the cases of diabetes and central vein catheterization. In fact, most of them 
was simply measured, disclosed, and monitored with various intervals. Why then did QIs improve by simply being measured and disclosed? My speculation on the mechanism of improvement through disclosure is that medical professionals are highly motivated to improve their own performance through Hawthorne effect, uh, improved performance results when we are seen by others, and also through recognizing evidence practice gap and the difference compared to other hospitals and physicians. In addition to this, we have experienced a paradigm shift. That is, there were many things we could do from organizational points of view as opposed to just asking individual staffs to improve their performance on their own efforts. That was exactly the same paradigm shift we had experienced already in the field of risk management more than decades ago. Organizational approaches include review of work process, review and installment of equipment and devices, review and amendment of rules and guidance guidelines in the hospital, arrangement of conferences and learning opportunities, feedback, improve the communication among medical staff, and asking patient collaboration. Recently, outside evaluation by Joint Commission International was also very effective to further improve our performance. In Japan, there are a variety of hospital groups and associations. Among them is Japan Hospital Association, consisting of about 2,500 hospitals. It is the largest and most influential hospital association and an only IHF member organization from Japan. Japan Hospital Association, to which our hospital belongs, started QI project in 2010 when the Ministry of Health of Japan started for the first time providing subsidies for several hospital associations to measure and disclose quality indicators following our experiences at St. Luke's. The number of participating hospitals has been increasing ever since from 30 to 300 37 in 2015. Most of the data collected from participating hospitals, in fact, are analyzed at St. Luke's. Feedbacks are made to all participating hospitals of statistically summarized data with each hospital's standings several times a year, and we hold symposium to share their improvement experiences at least once a year. In this project, I insisted that quality indicators should be used for longitudinal comparison to see improvement in the same institution, not for cross-sectional comparison among different institutions. Let me show you the feedback slides to our own hospital as an example. This slide shows the incidence rate of significant injuries due to trips and falls among hospitalized patients. The incidence rate of significant injury due to trips and falls shows the trend of decrease for St. Luke's International Hospital, as shown by blue line, in contrast to the increasing average rate of all participating hospitals, as shown by red line. This slide shows the control of blood sugar among diabetic patients. The percentage of diabetic patients who attained target hemoglobin A1c below 7% has been clearly improving at St. Luke's compared with the aggregate data of all participating hospitals. In 
2014, OECD rapporteur, a research team, visited Japan with a mission to evaluate the quality of medical care in member countries. We are happy that OECD rapporteur wrote this paragraph in the country report published in August 2015. It reads, the set of indicators in the DPCA, uh, that means Diagnosis Procedure Combination System, uh, Payment System of Japan, is not comprehensive enough to support quality monitoring and establish a clear picture of the quality of care provided. There are, however, some sophisticated initiatives conducted by some hospitals to measure and improve quality, but they are not uniform across the country. The Quality Indicator Project, undertaken by St. Luke's International Hospital, is particularly impressive and may serve as a model to be rolled out across the country. Another quotation is found on page 137. They spend whole page explaining our QI project with an example of door to balloon time. It reads the organization of regular conferences or meeting between doctors is another tool used to drive medical performance through improving communication. This approach has been very successful for acute myocardial infarction patients. Emergency physicians and cardiovascular doctors, for example, had the opportunity to specify the rule for care procedures regarding a patient with suspected myocardial infarction during these conferences. Since then, the proportion of myocardial infarction patients who received percutaneous coronary intervention within, 30, within 90 minutes of our arrival to the hospital has improved by nearly 20%. QI project at both St. Luke's International Hospital and Japan Hospital Association entailed continuous efforts to improve the process and outcome of patient care. We have to keep in mind that quality of medical care and patient safety are the most important mission for hospitals as well as for individual medical professionals. Action is mandatory at both personal and organizational levels. Quality indicators are useful tools for improving quality of care and patient safety through PDCA Kaizen cycle. I would think that Joint Commission International certainly helped us keep on such continuous improvement cycle. Medical professionals are highly motivated to improve their practice through being observed, comparison with evidence, other professionals, and other hospitals and continuous aspiration to excellence as a professional. In the future, further improvement will be accomplished by monitoring on real-time individual professionals' performance using more sophisticated information and communication technologies. I would like to close my talk with this final slide of the topics I have covered. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Fukui. So we will go ahead and take some time for some questions now. Just mm -hmm. a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the question box in your Skype per business control panel. While we wait for questions from our participants, let me take this opportunity to ask for the first question. Uh, if I may ask, Dr. Fukui, why do you yeah. think quality indicators should be used for longitudinal comparison in the same institution and not for cross-sectional comparison among different institutions? 
Uh, well, I would think it's because cross-sectional comparison between different institutions is difficult to guarantee scientific validity due to variations of patient characteristics among institutions. Patients are different in terms of severity of disease, socioeconomic status, educational background, among others. I think these factors have been statistically proven to be uh, highly related to health outcomes, regardless of quality of care provided. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Fukui. Looks like we have one question from Lakshmi Danyastani. The question is, how do you choose your quality measurement? Is there any references that you use? Yeah, we looked up uh, the list of quality indicators already used in the United States, uh, European countries, and Australia, and then we uh, sought the opinions about that from a related department and specialist in our hospital. And I tried to pick up quality indicators related to covering multiple expertise in the hospital, N not the only specialty or only department to make our hospital to be uh, enthusiastic as a whole hospital toward quality improvement. Yeah, th there, there have been already models and quality indicators used in other countries. Thank you for asking me. Okay, we have another question from Alpina Satil Ganova. It says, Dr. Fukui, thank you for your presentation. Yes. And the well. question is related yes. to Japan's specific selection of indicators. Were they considering disease burden in Japan? Well, I, I don't think we, ha we have quality indicators very, very unique to Japan. Most of the, the indicators were already used some, somewhere in the world, I think. But we do revise, we do think again every year which quality indicators most appropriate for us to, to proceed. But I, uh, we don't think much about the uniqueness of quality indicators in Japan compared to other countries. That's the question uh -huh. from LT9. Please type in your question. We still have mm -hmm. time for two more questions. Just a reminder for those who have just joined the webinar, so you can watch the recording of this session at the IHF website. Okay, we have a follow-up question from Lakshmi Danyastani. Says, I hear you mention there's, a, there's an added burden to clinical staff to provide data for quality improvement. How do you overcome mm -hmm. with this? Uh, actually, clinical staff, uh, they don't much provide their own data. Information manage, management staff, they themselves compile, withdraw data from electronic patient record system. Most of the data are available from electronic patient record. Uh, the clinical staff, they don't need to, for example, write down or keep a record uh, from their own patients. I don't think there is a, a extra burden because of this project on uh, clinical staffs, seeing patients. Uh, it looks like we've covered all of our questions. Uh -huh. Okay. Dr. Fukui, is there anything else yes. you wanted to cover before I wrap up? I think I've all done. Thank you. Okay. Everyone. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Fukui, for sharing yeah. your valuable knowledge. Thank, thank you. you, everyone. It was a pleasure being with you. Okay, thank, thank you. Everyone. We appreciate you being here. Today's Thank webinar you. will be available on demand at the IHF website. For those who registered, you will also receive an email with the link to watch the recording of this session. Thanks again for joining us today and we will see you next time. Have a nice day!